emergent, relocalized models that can challenge the current orthodoxy and re revit revitalize local markets. And uh, we have four speakers, and I'll introduce them as they speak. Um, our first speaker is Adrian Dolby, who's chief, chief executive of Bucleu Estates. Get this right. Well, head of agriculture at Bucleu Estates. Now, you'll, uh, Adrian will say more about it. But just to suffice to say, uh, this is a land holding of very considerable scale in southern Scotland. And I've known Adrian for many years now, and I'm really delighted to be able to introduce him to speak. Adrian. Thank you, and ladies and gentlemen, um, it's a great pleasure and a privilege to be here today in this remarkable building, and I would just like to start by, by thanking Sustainable Food Trust for what has been a hugely rewarding couple of days. It is very good to be back in the Cotswolds and to see many familiar faces in this, this beautiful landscape. I would like to begin by, a brief, by way of a brief introduction to Buclue, the origins of which began some 900 years ago in the 12th century within the lawless borders region between England and Scotland. And whilst the rule of law eventually prevails some 400 years later, although many may wish to differ, <laughs> the landscape itself has scarcely changed. Buclue represents the commercial interests of the Buclue family, where at the heart of this business is a vast natural resource, providing a platform for future economic development. Each of the Scottish estates represents significant catchment areas with Bowhill in the Scottish borders, Estelle and Liddesdale in Queensbury and Dumfries and Galloway and Bowton in Northamptonshire, combining to an area in excess of 230,000 acres, of which 60,000 acres are farmed in hand. They include small towns, villages and isolated steadings. The people who live, work and invest within these estates and surrounding areas not only contribute to the success of the rural economy, one that is more often than not constrained by economic activity. So as we evaluate the metrics of what constitutes sustainable agriculture, with a clue we account not only for soils, landscape and habitat, but also for social and economic factors that are equally valid in measuring success. The population of Scotland totals some 5 million people within a total area of 30,000 square miles, of which 85% is classified as less favoured area status. So to put this into context, it compares with a population in England, in England of 55 million people within an area of 50,000 square miles, of which only 15% is classified as LFA status. However, 70% of Scotland's population lies within the central lowlands between Glasgow, Edinburgh, Perth, and Dundee, which in turn translates to there being very few people living in southern Scotland, the Highlands and Islands. I'm not sure how this compares with Western Australia or Siberia, but it is potentially not dissimilar, although the climate in Australia is rather different, but alas, less so in Siberia. <laughs> Within Buclu, we have 130 tenants on farms ranging in size from a few hundred acres to several thousand that include fourth generation tenants to new entrants who have been farming for only a few years. Our new entrant program includes a diverse range of farms and I would like to comment on, I'd like to comment on a number of individuals who we are working with in developing their business towards what we refer to as competitive sustainable agriculture. Our starting point is to identify credible farms that have potential to deliver sustained positive cash flow. We analyse all our farms to identify the likely indicative return using Scottish Government data for a broad range of upland farms and hill farms based on average and top quartile performance. I should add that our analysis shows average performance is simply not a credible proposition, more often not than not a consequence of low productivity and high cost. I would also add that where we have modelled some basic assumptions on under a new UK agricultural and environmental policy, effectively a Brexit stress test, top quartile performance is challenged to the extent where one would question why would we continue to farm. Nevertheless, we remain optimistic and positive about the outlook towards a new agricultural and environmental policy. 
It is remarkable what the millennial generation of new farmers are able to achieve when they start with little work on capital and until recently no IX payment. What they bring to the table more often than not are excellent management skills, business plans and a clear understanding of the costs of their costs but also ambition and determination to generate new income from by every opportunity afforded within their business. Andrew and Eileen Marsh moved to Clonhe in 2011, an upland farm at Queensbury, with 10 breeding ewes and no BPS, but with an ambitious business plan designed to generate cash for reinvestment into breeding stock. Today, some seven years later, they farm with 1,100 crossbred ewes and 30 cows. Eileen is a primary teacher, whilst Andrew initially worked off farm to generate additional income. As their business grew, we were able to offer additional land through the introduction of Glengar, a 330-acre hill farm that in turn strengthened their cash flow through enhanced economies of scale. Our relationship with the Marchants continues to evolve after they approached the clue to assist them with establishing a commercial red deer enterprise that will, through a joint venture partnership, see over the next, next four years, 400 breeding hinds established as part of their strategy to diversify whilst retaining an ongoing commitment to cattle and sheep. Creating new opportunity for our next generation of farmers is fundamental to the success in our estates, but also within UK farming. John Park, sorry, next slide. John Park and his family are tenants at Bow Hill in the Scottish borders. Following the retirement of John's father in 2014, he wanted to continue farming Drinkston. However, it was evident in their business plan that they would struggle due to a lack of working capital that would see the farm understocked and poorly resourced and likely to slip into a downward spiral. Our response was to create a joint equity partnership underpinned by a five-year tenancy where we finance 50% of the working capital to help fund the acquisition of breeding stock, machinery, BPS entitlements, and thus enabling Drinkston to be fully resourced from the outset. At the end of a defined term, John will have generated sufficient capital to purchase the Clues equity, with a view to establishing an alternative lease going forwards. I think it is fair to say that John has been challenged by the rigour with which we apply to our in-hand farms, be it through monthly reporting, benchmarking or other areas such as a proactive health and safety policy, but nevertheless such insight has broadened his and our horizons. But creating opportunity in this landscape is not simply about secure tenancies. There are other ways in which people and families maintain a livelihood in farming. It may be through being proactive in establishing farm apprenticeships, contract shepherding opportunities, developing staff careers to create our, our next generation of managers, or embrace, embracing joint ventures to benefit both local farmers and tenants and Buclu. The Coley family live in an isolated area in the southern uplands, an area that at times could quite easily resemble Siberia. <coughs> Richard Coley and his son work with Queensbury's farm manager, who is responsible for some 10,000 blackface ewes, covering an area of 25,000 acres, a landscape where stocking rates are determined by acres per ewe rather than ewes per acre. <laughs> the family provides shepherding in part to our commercial hill flocks and also at an elite nucleus flock to ensure high genetic bloodlines are maintained. In addition, we engage with two local farmers for additional shepherding support that enables Queensbury Farms to operate with some, over some 25,000 acres with a manager, a shepherdess, a pickup truck and a quad bike. Such collaboration demonstrates how, as an industry, we can work smarter. It enables the clue to achieve top quartile performance whilst maintaining significantly lower costs of production, whilst the Coley family are able to supplement their farm income in an extremely remote and challenging part of southern Scotland. <coughs> this is very much a family affair, and I particularly recall on one occasion one of Richard's daughters, whose day job is as a beautician, jumping on a quad bike with a couple of dogs in tow and expertly gathering a group of black-faced tubs for us to view. The skill and resilience of this family is truly impressive. Collaboration enables a business to focus on its strengths, what it does well whilst allowing other parties to deliver efficiencies through their enhanced economies of scale. In Northamptonshire, a recent collaboration in our arable enterprise has enabled us to reduce our costs by 140,000 a year 
whilst removing a cyclical capital requirement of £1 million every five years. Our in-hand farms in the Scottish borders operate under a very different model. Through dedicated staff, machinery and the requisite infrastructure associated with nearly 600 suckle cows, 8,500 ewes, a free-range egg enterprise, an AD plant that is run on cattle manure, um, over an area of just under 15,000 acres. The business directly employs 11 full-time staff and six part-time staff. UK agriculture has to nurture the next generation of ambitious, technically smart and resilient people if we are to improve productivity and efficiency. We invest significant resources in staff development that not only ensures continuity within, us, within our farms, but also provides career opportunities for young people. For example, Alice Muir, our farm manager at Estelle and Liddesdale, who has responsibility for nearly 18,000 acres. This is the future of our industry, and we have to develop that talent. Lantra project a general decline in all farm employment, identifying a need for 60,000 new entrants to agriculture over the next 10 years. They have concluded that only 50 to 70% of recruits will be forthcoming. This is not a positive indicator of sustainability. Ryan Paxton initially joined us as a 17-year-old apprentice and today oversees our young stock and finishing unit. In contrast, Mark Scott joined Bowhill in 1988 on a youth training programme and recently received his 30-year long service award from the Scottish Borders Agricultural Society. Today, we have four pre-apprentice students two of whom will be retained under a three-year apprenticeship programme. As opportunities arise through retirement or expansion and diversification, our apprentice programme will enable these positions to be filled, or if not, they will enter the industry as highly trained with strong technical skills alongside safe working practices. As society increasingly and rightly demands high environmental standards in our rural landscape, be it clean water, diversity, habitat, diversity of habitat, carbon sequestration, or enhanced access for recreation. So we as farmers and land managers need to respond to deliver these outcomes. But such demands come with change, not only in on-farm practice, but also changes in land use. <coughs> At Estale, we are currently engaged in a public consultation in planting new modern commercial forestry that will, that will be a change in land use from the current hill farming activity that will see 3,000 acres planted with a mixture of citrus spruce and hardwood. We acknowledge such change in land use may not sit comfortably with everyone. It is a dynamic tension between the demands of our society towards carbon mitigation, future housing and commercial land management, or a desire to maintain hefted hill flocks, generations of farming families, and a landscape society is more familiar with. Sustainable land use will inevitably see changes to traditional landscapes, but will bring new enhanced opportunities for public access, tourism, employment, through new investment in delivering clean energy and timber planting for future generations. Our commitment to renewable energy will play an important role in the future of our estates and local communities through a number of new initiatives that include wind, solar and pump storage hydro. In Dumfries and Galloway, we are cur de currently developing the former Glen Mucklock open cast coal mine uh, to what will be a 240 megawatt project having recently secured grid connection. It illustrates how as society drives change, we see old technology being replaced by new clean tech. Further development in wind will see up to 150 megawatts through 30 turbines installed in the North Lowther Hills, an area recognised as one of Scotland's optimum sites for wind turbines and this site here just shows the hole in the ground from from coal extraction it covers about 400 acres so it's for those of you at the back it's not a small puddle in the countryside I have the next slide and this slide just shows what what this will look like this is the the hole in the ground with the new reservoir constructed at the top so technology has and continues to play a huge role in the ability of our farms to improve productivity, such as maximizing grass dry matter, nutrient efficiency, stock quality, and the health that in turn, turn directly enhances cash flow, but also in reducing the impact of farming on the environment. 
At Bowhill, new cost-effective technology continues to play a key role in driving our business forward. The Precision Innovation Centre, otherwise known as the Agri Epicenter, is part of an agri-tech strategy launched by government in 2013. A £150 million investment to deliver research and development into precision agriculture. Within our strategy for farms, technology is identified as a key component to ongoing success through a new era of information technology and science that will assist us in optimising production whilst controlling cost. Bow Hill acts as an agri epicentre satellite farm to assess research and development to aid the improvement in productivity and efficiency within beef and sheep through precision equipment, sensors and data recording. Current projects include measurement in real time the herd's heat and calving status, enabling staff to monitor core body temperature and health status of each individual animal. Calving alerts are sent 20 hours before the head of calving, enabling resources to focus on the, those cows due to calve in any given day. As an example, if we are able to reduce our existing calving losses by, say, 10% on 600 suckle cows, this equates to sales of an additional six yearling cattle some 12 months later. And this is just a, an example of what you will get on your smartphone. Sorry, previous one. Um, and the technology works. Um, this is the second season that we've used this, and it is um, proving very useful, although we are very much just touching the top of the iceberg, the tip of the iceberg. But R&D investment must also extend to improving incredibly valuable assets as blanket peat bogs to sequester carbon or habitat management in reducing flood risk. In summary, over the next four years, we have a, a unique opportunity to shape the success of both our environment and our farms through a new UK policy. I would therefore like to conclude by way of proposing new content within UK policy. with agriculture, with radically enhanced environmental and health out, out, outcomes in, inclusive to all farmers. So to summarise, investment in research and development. Enhanced funding is established for investment in agriculture and environmental science, whereby R&D is targeted to improve farm productivity and efficiency, but also R&D is targeted to preserve and protect natural assets that mitigate society's carbon footprint. Investment in digital communications, an immediate and real return will be secured through advanced broadband and mobile networks, allowing rural economies to grow and develop, creating new opportunities for device diversification to shorten supply chains, um, enhanced education and engage remote rural communities. Encouraging, encouragement of collaboration, through tax concessions and financial grants, farmers are incentivized to fund capital projects and to work more collaboratively. Incentivizing farmers to enhance the environment. Establishing a contract unconstrained by capping for protection and preservation of our natural environment that places a monetary value on current natural resources. It's very encouraging to hear what was spoken by Dieter Helm yesterday. Alongside this will be ambitious contractual obligations, for example, metrics that recognize clean water, the sequestering of carbon, flood mitigation, and biodiversity. Carbon trading. Government recognises the vital importance of the UK's uplands as carbon sinks and the farmer's role in protecting a resource of national importance. Establishing a monetary value of the contribution of land in offsetting carbon emissions and, is, and to establish a carbon exchange where industry may offset emissions intra-regionally in order to achieve a balanced delivery nationwide. This concept may challenge many, but it will force industry to place a monetary value on their carbon emissions and in turn will encourage shareholders and society to demand change to practices that pollute. Recognition of the uplands. Recognise the natural constraint of the less favoured areas through their contribution not only in food production and the environment, but in protecting and preserving a landscape for recreation that promotes physical and mental health now and for future generations. And finally, investment in training and the upskilling of the current workforce through apprenticeships, leadership programmes and further education in agriculture and rural industries for optimum production and the use of new technologies 
that attracts future generations into this incredible and exciting industry that we all work in. Thank you very much. Adrian, thank you. You're so uh, impeccable and professional. And what I, what I love about knowing you is to the reassurance of knowing that somebody who's in charge of such a large area of farmed land burns with the same values that we all share. So thank you very much. Um, our second speaker um, is Caroline Grindrod, Primal Meats. Now, we've only just met but uh, we spoke on the phone, and I know that you were going to come from a very different entrepreneurial end of the spectra, spectrum. And, uh, Who's not the most professional and competitive? <laughs> <laughs> well, we love that too. Yeah. <laughs> so, welcome. Thank you. And thank you very much for inviting me and all the work that's gone into this amazing event. So I've been asked to share a bit about our internet business, Primal Meats. And I don't think I was asked because it's some big influential business. It's certainly not. But Primal Meats and our way of looking at the supply chain as a whole is a purpose-driven business that perhaps might inspire others to do things a little bit differently and perhaps think outside the box. I've been in livestock farming for 20 odd years and I both love and hate farming. <laughs> I've been inspired by amazing farmers who care very deeply about their livestock and land, and I've witnessed cruel horrors to livestock and nature. Just like business, farming is a neutral activity that can be a toxic, cruel mess, or it can be a way to change the world for the better. I started in conservation, working on protecting wildlife and important habitats. This is really important work, but often it comes at great expense to the taxpayer. It is, however, vital that we learn how to work with nature, not against it, to produce our food. And in the meantime, we need to protect the biodiversity, as well as protect diversity in farm species and livestock breeds. But I started to realize that farming in a certain way could be great for the land, biodiversity and a powerful way to produce nourishing food. But how the, how the heck do we get more of the good farming and less of the not so good farming? In my experience, legislation has been relatively ineffective at you delivering these assurances. It wasn't until I nearly worked myself into an early grave and ended up with a broken down endocrine system that I truly discovered the best way to influence animal welfare and you know, get better land management. When you're sick and in fear of not seeing your children grow up, you'll pay whatever is required to get a potential solution. So I learned about nutrition and ancestral health and I managed to eat my way back to better health. I think it's customers who have got the power to drive the change in how we manage our land. And, and we seem to unfortunately have a whole lot of people in this country suffering with degenerative diseases. Having developed a small butchery at U Tree Farm, where I was for 12 years, I learned the hard way the issues of running a meat business. Trying to shift the bucket full of mints you get for every fillet steak that you can sell. The wholesale customers who want all your best cuts but don't pay the bills. And the fluctuating trends in, in cuts. One minute it's ribeye steak, the next minute it's beef cheeks, and now we even have a waiting list for beef bones. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and having a tiny window of opportunity to sell the whole carcass. This is definitely not easy money. I had to become an expert in nutrition, run multiple complementary food businesses, including a cafe, a burger van to try and sell all the four quarter meat, become a PR demon, an internet entrepreneur, and learn the art of butchery. And let's not forget the small task of running a profitable hill farm using grass-fed animals in a way that regenerates important habitats and gives a year-round consistent drip feed of award-winning and perfectly marbled, is perfect tasting meat. Surely this isn't required for every hill farm to make it profitable. Mm -hmm. 
So when I left the farm, I had the great fortune of being able to step back and look at the whole supply chain. I mean, Primal Meats was really a way of me using my experience to try and help more farmers just focus on what they do well. And I would try and use my skills to get their product to market. The problem, of course, was, and possibly still is, that the market wasn't quite ready. So I applied holistic management to how we approach the business, and I started to work on the, the marketing conversion weekly in the chain of production. And for those of you that don't know, holistic management is a process of decision making and planning developed by Alan Savory. This is not just a great way of managing land, but it can be applied to businesses and the whole supply chain too. So I studied nutrition and worked with therapists to understand how diet impacts health and what foods are best for restoring health. Then the link between the soil health and human health has become more and more interesting to me. I've written and talked about that, this a lot in different places. And the similarities between the gut microbiome and the soil microbiome is astounding. And I think that the, the soil, I think of the soil as the land's gut and our gut as the body's soil. If we damage soil with harmful chemicals and practices. We also destroy our own systems. The cycle of land management, livestock and wildlife health and human health can't be separated out. It's a whole and we need to learn how to manage it as such. So we seem to have hit the nail on the head. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people that are struggling with their health out there who end up on our virtual doorstep with money to spend. We've even developed a new eating approach designed to rebuild health and simultaneously drive ecological restoration, which we call the wildebore approach. As a way of supporting farmers to transition to a more regenerative approach, we first created the demand. But in holistic management, as soon as you address the weakest link in the chain of production, you then need to immediately turn to the, the link that's most likely to break next, which for us was the results conversion. There just aren't enough farmers producing food in this way. And a lot of our time and effort currently is going into addressing this particular problem. And lucky for us, there's lots of other great people doing the same work. Primal Meats is built on trust. And we offer our customers the guarantee that they'll get healthy meat grown on healthy soils and it'll have been reared organically using the food that the animals are designed to eat. The customers trust us to use our experience in farming and holistic management to find their farmers for them. We use great certification marks like Pasture for Life and Unorganic to help assure customers, but we really do work on a personal approach built through engagement and learning. When our customers order, they don't get to choose where the meat comes from, they buy into the fact that we can assure them it's a great farm. This allows us to work with small family farms and direct the orders who can, to who can best fulfill them. The orders get sent to the customers direct from that farm. We can concentrate on getting customers without the cost of and issues of running uh, our own premises. And the PFLA track system allows the customer still to get the full traceability and assurance that this comes after they receive the meat. This localised system supports their existing supply arrangements <coughs> and ensures we support, support local abattoirs rather than transporting livestock to centralised systems. The next pain point is balancing the carcass. But by building trust, we've encouraged our customers to join into a membership programme where we decide which cuts to send them every month. Different cuts offer different health benefits and we can achieve good carcass utilisation and zero waste. Every piece of the carcass tastes great if it's cooked well, and we feel every piece should be valued equally. We don't sell wholesale. We get lots of inquiries, but we tend to send these on to our producers to see if that's going to help their business. This way, we keep our cash flow up front instead of months behind. We set our prices based on what we need to make to pay our producers fairly. We don't try and compete with other companies on price, and we don't advertise to try and increase our business quickly. In fact, we've hardly advertised at all. We use content internet marketing and relationship building to grow our revenue, and it's on track again to double this year. And this keeps our running costs really low. 
We believe that the cost of food has been driven too low by huge centralized systems that have externalized their costs to get consumers more convenience and cheap food. And we're not even going to try and compete in this playground. We encourage customers to pay the true cost of the food and explain that what they pay for is not just calories, it's a vote towards their health, the future of the planet, and the welfare of their animals. Yes, of course, it makes it more difficult for families on low incomes to buy good food in a modern society. But instead of trying to cheapen food, we need to address the root cause. My grandparents, who lived all of their lives in a, a council house in the middle of Newcastle, spent more as a portion of their income on their food than I do now. They lived into the 90s in great health and happiness, and they certainly didn't throw away 30% of food in the bin like we do in the UK now. Cheap food has allowed families to spend more on other stuff, and it's disconnected us from the land. And unfortunately, people don't attribute the wicked problems that we face globally to the root cause of soil degradation, caused a lot, in, in, in great part, by the production of the, the cheap food and those, that cheap merchandise. I think this is the big, big link that we all need to be working hard on. So, how could this be a solution at scale? Our model has unlimited potential growth, all without compromising any of our close, closely held principles. I've seen many small, passionate businesses sell out their principles to chase large-scale large wholesale arrangements, and I wanted to create a different model. And as long as we continue to strengthen all the links in the chain of production, we can take on more farmers, increase the reach to a wider range of customers, and hopefully work with innovative and holistic-minded <coughs> businesses who can help strengthen the issues in the product conversion link, such as the need for more regional abattoirs, better delivery networks and systems, and more sustainable packaging options. We'll continue our work helping farmers move to a more regenerative model, and we'll keep on developing the market to find new and unique, innovative ways of addressing each new challenge as it no doubt will emerge. I think of our business as being a, a part of a supply ecology. In natural systems, the more interconnections between species, the more resilient and able to weather change the environment. The number of potential new habitats is endless. But to do this, I think we need a, a shift in thinking and doing. It requires a shift from globalization to localization, from competition to collaboration, and from reductionist thinking to holistic thinking. And I'd just like to use one more analogy from nature, and then I'm done. A keystone species is one whose presence and role within an ecosystem has a disproportionate effect on the other organisms within the system. The species can significantly alter the habitat around them. Well, we humans are certainly a keystone species, but what if we took on a new role as a conscious keystone species and we use our empowered buying actions to positively impact the environment? Once upon a time, to eat meat, you'd have to hunt it, kill it, prepare it, preserve it and cook it. And now you can just go to a shop or buy it online. Is it too much to ask that we properly research our farming and food systems and plan a bit ahead? I think we need a consumer revolution that demands better food and is willing to pay the true cost of it. If we want a planet that will sustain our future generations into good health and be a place where nature thrives, then we need to take up our place in the supply ecology and play our part well. Thank you very much. That was, that was amazing. Thank you. Uh, I love the idea of a conscious keystone, keystone species. I'll get it. Um, it's, I think we've, we've moved from a landscape scale project with young, mainly emergent young people looking after the bits of it, to a disruptive uh, and yet holistic uh, challenge to the existing marketing system. And now we've got another one uh, in the shape of Ben Pugh, the founder of Palm Drop founded in 2014, and uh, we are looking forward to hearing your story. Thanks, thanks everybody, thanks Patrick. Um, and um, yeah, my, 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 
opening sensation, I guess, is, is just one of feeling very humble to be stood here, uh, having the honour of, of chatting with this group who I've had a very, very moving and enriching two days with. So if I, if I sound nervous, then, then that's the reason, because it's, it's been a really incredible couple of days. Um, and, and a lot of the things that Caroline was just picking up on uh, ran very close to my heart in terms of efforts around trying to, 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 to will changes in, in, in consumer behaviour. In fact, I actually had my own epiphany, the penny dropped for me in terms of how this whole system fits together and how the conventional system is so broken uh, in about 2012. And the, and the first couple of years of farm drop were, were really me standing outside tube stations in the rain, haranguing people uh, and trying to tell them to help me fix the food chain and shouting at them about we must do more to support sustainable producers and actually we need to we need to sort out the environment and what about animal welfare and actually um, the, the learnings were very hard and, and they're probably best summarized by a, a quote a Bob Dylan quote which is um, which is that uh, people seldom do what they believe actually more often they do what's convenient and then repent. And, 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 and that's every day at Farm Drop, I think I experience the, the truth in that. Um, and that's why every day at Farm Drop, we, we turn up at work and we just try and make it easier for customers and producers to, to move the food between themselves. And every time we do make it easier, we take another step forward. Um, very much in the DNA of Farm Drop is this idea that um, it's not suppliers, consumers. Actually, we've got two groups of customers and they're both equally important. One of th those groups eat the food and the other of those groups produce the food. And we go to great lengths to listen and, and, and and really pay attention, and, and the blueprint of Farm Drop has been evolved and built around what farmers tell us is, uh, are important to them. We're not the finished article, we have a, a long way to go to, to, make, to make it all it can be. But what I'll do over a few slides is, is, is tell you what it currently is, and, um, and, and, and let's see how we get on. Um, so, so I'm Ben, I'm the founder and CEO of Farm Drop, and I, and I started Farm Drop, because my view of the conventional food system is that it's, it's, it's essentially broken. Um, the fact that, and we talked about this a lot over, over a couple of days, the fact that producers get such a small share of retail price is frankly ridiculous in the mobile internet era. Um, the fact that food is moving around for thousands and thousands of miles and is overly processed, um, I also think is completely ridiculous. And when, and when I started looking at this, this problem, um, actually, I found that even living in, living in central London, um, the formats that were on offer, whether they were farmers markets or local shops or box schemes, they just weren't offering the requisite levels of, of convenience. And I, I, found them, I found them difficult to engage with in terms of filling my fridge and my cupboards with sustainable food week in, week out. Um, so, so, so we reimagined it, and, and the solution, we believe, is, is to radically reduce the cost of moving the food between sustainable producers and customers. Because if you can radically reduce that cost, then, then we can have all the wonderfully important things that we spent the last couple of days talking about. Um, sorry, Bonnie, I've, I've just been cut out of the system, uh, which <laughs> is probably my fault. Um, so, so what I mean by that is that um, if I can radically reduce the cost of moving the food, then I can only distribute on behalf of sustainable producers, i.e. you guys, people who are really looking after their environment, people who are really looking after their animals. We only distribute on, on behalf of, of those producers. Um, what that means is that we can, we can also give producers a much higher share of retail price. Um, we move all the food within 24 hours between producers and customers, and that means that the, the, the customers themselves have, a, an, have an amazing experience in terms of much fresher food, which is what keeps them coming back. Um, in terms of the actual journey, um, you go on to the, to, the, to the mobile app as a customer and you could order over 2,000 different products from over 300 different producers. 
And, and that's really important for actually keeping customers on the, on the system because they can do their whole weekly shop with us. They place the orders, producers will see those orders real time, and then at about one second past noon every day, we, we disaggregate and re-aggregate. I was thinking a lot about Joel's phrase, um, electronic aggregation. Farm Drop is entirely based on the idea of electronic aggregation. Um, we send all those orders out to the producers, and then they send the food in the following morning. It's, it's, a, it's essentially like a wholesale delivery. We receive the food, we have a team of people who are using mobile tablets to quality control the food and, and put it in the right box before it goes whizzing off uh, in, in the back of electric vans into, into customers' houses. Um, it's, it's, the, the technology is involved. We, we, we operate more than four different mobile products. It's not just the ones that the, the customers use, but the fact that actually we've got producers now in their fields checking their orders real time has been transformational. The fact that we've got uh, performance-related pay in our, in our packing hubs, we, we pay better terms than any other grocer, that's very important. I'm trying to avoid leading us to bloody Amazon, which is essentially like Blade Runner's future. Um, and, and, and the farm drop is also, we take real care over those guys. They're invited to join pension schemes and option schemes. Those sort of things we think are really important. Um, and it's all, this whole thing is based on mobile technology, and the power of it is, is represented in this chart. In a conventional system, uh, producers would be lucky if they get 40% of the retail price. Because we've radically reduced the cost of moving the food between the producer and the actual customer's house, actually we pay all our local producers over 70% of the retail price. And um, that's, yeah, that's the whole point. <laughs> that's the whole point of the but very importantly, um, it doesn't mean customers are paying big prices, they're not. This is a disintermediation idea, so you're, you're sharing the gains of lower costs with both sides, producers and customers. This, this is simply saying that on a unit economic basis, it's working very well. Actually, producers are having a great experience, customers are, are paying sensible prices, and actually the business itself um, is generating money in order to pay van drivers and, and for all of the other stuff that we've got to do. Um, we're having a, a, a really extraordinary period of growth which we want to, to, to foster the continuation of but do it in a very sustainable way because, because we feel very excited about what we're creating. We don't want to run it too fast and break it. A, we're being fueled by having put a good service into the market but also this addiction to convenience isn't going anywhere. Um, when I started Farm Drop five years ago, online home delivery was five billion. It's now 10 billion. Um, if I'm invited back to speak in five years from now, which I very much hope I am, um, uh, then it will be up to 15 billion. And this is all about people wanting to be at home and tap away on their, on their smartphones and then for food to magically appear. There's very little empathy out there, by the way, in main 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 school consumer trends. They just want amazing food on, the, on their terms, at the time of their choosing. And so we've just got to embrace that. And so we, 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 have, to, we have to deliver this incredible, sustainable food, but also with, with all of the convenience levels. And you can see that we've actually got some, some market-leading trust pilot scores there, which we're, which we're really proud of. P pricing I've talked about a bit, it's really important pricing, because I just don't believe there's enough there's not enough rich people in the world to actually create a sustainable food system out of. And we lay up somewhere sort of between Ocado and the larger box schemes. Um, we get great producer testimonials. I think you're about to gong me, aren't you, Patrick? No, I'm no? About to okay. Okay, okay, sorry, sorry. Um, we get great producer testimonials, which is, which is also the whole point. Because if we can build a system that producers love engaging with, then actually, we're, we're going to be in a position where we, 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 we can proudly distribute the best food that there is. And that's really how we, we think about this every day. Um, in terms of what we're, we're, we're going to do next, we're, we, we want to actually appear in different parts of the country. At the moment, we're London and we're Bristol. Um, we also want to grow our customer numbers. Um, and we also really, really want to invest more in the, in the platform and the tech because we know we can make it's so much stronger for both, for both sides of the marketplace. Um, I think that, that's it for me. Thank you very much indeed. Um, and look forward to taking questions.
thanks so much, Ben. Uh, we're looking forward to the questions. But before we have the questions, we're going to go to our last speaker, uh, who is Dorina Allen. Um, yesterday, we were talking about uh, public money for public goods. And then I tried to give Dieter help and rather failed to give him a hard time for focusing only on natural capital and not until recently extending his remit to include uh, social and human capital. So I think it's very appropriate that we hear from Dorina. And I think the plan, Dorina, is you're going to show us a sort of lightning series of slides, aren't you? So I'll, I'll give a little tiny bit of background first. Yes. And then I'll do the, unfortunately, my slides are not completely in sync with what I think. So I'll just probably do this quickly and then I quickly run over some of the slides. Yeah, that's, that's probably good to just let them let them run. You a, yes, so you're going to talk yes. and tell your story with slides, with illustrated slides, and then, then we're going to sit down and I'm going to interview you. Well, we'll see you. what happens. <laughs> okay. Well, just for the many of you who may not ever have heard of a place called Ballymaloo, um, the Ballymaloo Cooking School, which is uh, I co-founded with my brother, uh, is in the middle of a 100-acre organic farm down in the south coast of Ireland, very close to the sea. And uh, we started the school in... 1983 on the farm and um, it seemed like a very unlikely thing to do at that time when Ireland was very much looked on as the home of corned beef and cabbage and why did we think people might ever come to Ireland uh, uh, to a cooking school or even Irish people because uh, that time a lot of Irish people were not a lot but certainly some Irish people were going to the Cordon Bleu in London or Paris and so we thought anyway and why did we I, I'm often asked why did you start this cooking school uh, down on a farm and uh, it was of course an alternative farming enterprise and it was certainly born out of desperation <laughs> and uh, there's a lot to be said for desperation actually things really have to work if you're desperate and this was in the, the late 1970s and for us there was uh, the perfect storm really we were in horticulture my husband had in, uh, uh, inherited um, horticultural enterprise from his father who's one of a great entrepreneurial farmer who had uh, both agriculture and, and horticultural enterprises we had five acres of greenhouses and grew mushrooms orchards all that sort of thing and then of course in the late uh, 1970s if you remember labor costs started to rise significantly we'd gone into the eu there was the oil crisis and 25 percent inflation and we were heating as a young married couple penniless married couple really we were heating five acres of greenhouses that desperately needed to be invested in uh, and then the oil uh, in the, there was the oil crisis and the oil price shot up. So really within a short time, uh, we were looked at the poss distinct possibility of losing the roof over our heads. And we had four small children at that time. At the same time, the supermarkets came on stream, of course, and the whole cheap food policy kicked in. So every time we took our lovely produce into court to the wholesalers, it was at that time, basically we seem to get less for it. And there seemed to be on a mission, basically, to make sure that they could find some fault with your produce, no matter how lovely it was, so they could pay you less or send some of it back. So it just got worse and worse. And we'd very fortunately inherited a house when we got married from my, uh, my parents-in-law and this 100-acre farm. And then they said, well, you get on with it now, earn a living from that and so on. And here we were. Um, so uh, with this situation, we were getting less and less for our projects, and we could, we could clearly see the writing on the wall. And uh, so somebody said to us, Look, forget about the wholesalers. The, the supermarkets are the way to go, you know. Just go in and get a, a, a contract from the supermarket. So we were thrilled when we got a contract to supply uh, an apples, because they were, the supermarket were getting a, a lot of flack because they weren't selling Irish apples. Uh, to, from one of the big supermarket chains in Ireland. And so, uh, you know, my husband and his men would be up at early in the morning getting everything packed into the van, take it in, and uh, into Cork. And, um, the, and th th then he would have some young uh, supermarket buyer, you know, again, finding fault with everything. And remember, we were quite big growers, so we had, uh, it wasn't as though we didn't have grading machines and all sorts of things, but anyway. So remember one morning in particular, um, I used to get the children off to school by the time he went into Cork and then uh, there'd be a lovely moment in every day when he'd arrive back from Cork and we'd sit down and have breakfast together. And I remember he came in through the kitchen door looking so despondent and, you know, uh, and he said to me, look, he said, I don't care if I have to crawl on my knees, I'm never doing that again. And he'd just been into a supermarket, met some brat of a buyer who wouldn't have been able to grow a radish if his life depended on it, <laughs> or whatever. Uh, you know, it was, uh, must have, it was, maybe he was on a commission to find fault uh, with the thing anyway. And he said, I don't care. 
So what happens? We must find a different way to earn a living. We simply have to find a different way to earn a living. We'll have to look at what talents we have and what resources we have between us to find a living in a different way. And uh, we have to think outside the box in the way many of you have already spoken about. And remember now, I had no ambition when I was at, in my teens and, and, and at boarding school with the lovely Dominican nuns at Wicklow, I had absolutely no ambition. <laughs> Uh, basically, but to, uh, you know, maybe get a little job. And my whole thing was to actually find and look out for a nice fellow, preferably with a bit of money. And I'd have a, a couple of cute little kids and I'd paint my nails and go on picnics and all that sort of thing. So I, uh, so I had, and I, and I had been looking after the four children at that stage. And I, but, um, so we, I really, the last thing I wanted to do was to commute into Cork uh, every day. We were desperate to find some way to keep the roof over our heads but to continue to live in the country on the land that we love like all of you do uh, so um, i had to, i'd done hotel management in um in after i left to uh, uh, boarding school and because i'd got a you know that was a kind of i mustn't go on too long because i know the time is short but in a way um of course the dominican nuns were considered to be very visionary nuns so they were encouraging us girls to have a proper career this was in the early 60s do, do law, do science, do, do uh, you know, be a doctor, whatever. And um, we were going to be career women, because of course it was only women, it was only girls. And so anyway, all I wanted to do was to cook or to grow. So I was a big disappointment. Uh, and uh, so and I remember one of the nuns saying, well, you're never going to need that, my dear. You know, you're going to be a career woman. Anyway, so the whole, the big strong message was that the only, only kind of skills that were important were academic skills. And look what we've done since. We've let several generations out of our houses without equipping them with their basic skills to feed themselves. So in a way, that's one of the, really, um, I hope I live to see the day when I can, and many other people who are, uh, feel strongly about it as well, see uh, cooking and indeed growing embedded in the national curriculums again, in all of our countries. <laughs> take up our pens and, and things. Um, so um, again, this is at a time when, remember, chefs and cooks, uh, uh, chefs uh, uh, had no status whatsoever. There was no such thing as a celebrity chef. And also women ran tea shops. They couldn't even get into uh, top restaurants. But so they said to me, well, if you insist, my dear, it's a, a degree in, in uh, horticulture or hotel management. So I opted for hotel management. Anyway, fast forward. Um, now, so in, uh, that's a little bit of background there, and then when I came out, you never know in your life what's the little thing that's going to change the course of the rest of your life. It's often a tiny thing, actually. Uh, but in my case, it was when, again, when I was leaving hotel school in Dublin, I had, everybody else in my class had got a, a job at that stage. And uh, the sort of job you would get from this hotel management course would be, um, you, you would be an assistant manager in a hotel. You'd have a lovely little uniform, you'd have a badge saying you were assistant manager was another word, as far as I was concerned, for slave. <laughs> and so I, I didn't want to do that, I wanted to cook. Uh, but so I had no job, everybody else in my class had a job. And I met one of the senior lecturers uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the corridor one day and she said, haven't you got a job yet? And I, I said, well, I haven't. And she said, well, why haven't you? you know, and I, I told her I really wanted to learn, I wanted to cook more, I wanted to learn about souffles and pâtés and tureens and all the sort of things that sounded so exotic then. And, uh, and, I, and I wanted to learn more about fresh herbs and so on. And so she said to me, uh, she, she told me I was too fussy, but then she said, well, funny, I was at a, a dinner party a couple of nights ago, they were talking about this woman down in Cork who has opened a restaurant in her own house out on a farm in the middle of the country. And she writes the menu every day, depending on what's in the garden and so on, and what fish comes in from the boats near the near Valley Cotton down there. And they have fresh herbs, and they have a dairy herd, and they make ice cream from their cream, and everything. And I couldn't believe my ears. And I said to her, my God, that's exactly, I didn't say my God. Well, that, I don't think, <laughs> that's exactly what I want. Uh, you know, uh, they, and uh, uh, she couldn't remember her name. So she came back a few days later with a piece of paper, and she said, this is the name of the woman right to her. And the name on the piece of paper was Myrtle Allen, who's now my mother-in-law. So that's how it's done. You're married to boss's son. There you are. <laughs> anyway, I'm meant to be talking about that thing. Anyway. <laughs> I know, I won't be, I'll be very quick. I'll be very quick. Yeah. So now, fast forward, students come from all over the world at this point in time. And it's mostly word of mouth. And they come to the cooking school in Ireland on a farm because they want to see food produced from the farm to the fork. So the first thing we do on the first morning is we take them out 
introduce them to the uh, to the uh, that's me on the first morning actually <laughs> running my hands through the soil and saying remember this is where it all starts in the good earth. But Jamini, and, you're going to say the story about how you started the school. Oh, have I not said that? No. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Well, what's that story? Well, I didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to borrow some money and you... Oh, God, yeah. Well, it was in the piggeries, wasn't it? Oh, it was, yeah, yes. Well, actually, yes. Um, <laughs> anyway, yes, we had no money. I, 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 I said that already. And so we, uh, I worked out somehow or other that we needed to borrow 18,000 uh, to actually convert some farm buildings on the farm uh, into a little cooking school. And at that time, it was the really worst part of the recession uh, the last recession in Ireland, not this one we just had, but the one before that. <laughs> and, and, and so basically, uh, the, everybody said um, that, that, you know, you have the hope of getting money. They were all complaining about bank managers and all the rest of the same thing. Anyway, I made an appointment, uh, I borrowed a little suit. Uh, a friend of mine helped me to write out, I actually had to be, I mean, this sounds ridiculous. I had to have be, be explained the difference between a debtor and a creditor. I was that bad. Uh, I mean, you can't believe, you can't even believe, and not even a laugh for that because you can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, somebody wrote out, on, a friend of ours who was quite good at money wrote out, and he said, you have to know how to speak to the bank manager properly. I went to the, into the bank manager, and uh, he was so, everybody said they were awful, but he was so nice. And uh, he, I told him about this terrific idea I had to start a cooking school and converted farm, farm buildings out on a farm in Chanagary. And that I, I, I thought people would come and that they might even come from abroad eventually. And uh, so he was, uh, he gave me tea and biscuits and everything. And I was, I was so excited about this idea. And uh, then he said to me, he listened and listened and seemed very relaxed. And then he said to me, well, I'll have to discuss it with my colleagues. Well, I would know now what that meant, you know. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, but, so I went off and he and came back. At least I didn't come back. About a few days later, I got, a, um, I got a letter in the post sort of saying no. Well, not no like that, but no. And it was, the tone of the letter was more or less, we need to save you from yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so, and years later, anyway, my father, very fortunately, my father-in-law and mother-in-law really believed that this was a good idea, and they were desperate for us to find a way to earn a living anyway. Uh, so they decided, they said, forget your bank, which is a savings bank where we had a little overdraft in, go to our bank and we go guarantor for you. So how lucky were we? Uh, but then, basically, um, the, so uh, I went to their bank and we... Uh, uh, then, you know, built the cooking school and off we went. Did I leave out a bit of it? I did, probably. Uh, but <laughs> that's more or less now it, yeah. Pardon? Now you can fast forward. Right. How oh, is it now? Yes. Well, just one other little thing about that. I didn't meet that bank manager for about 20 years. And I, I said, I met him at a drinks party one night. And I, I said to him, do you remember me? And I'd come in to you. And he said, I do remember, of course. And I said, well, I was completely fooled. I thought she thought it was a great idea. And he said, well, what? and I said, what? He said, once you started to talk, you got so excited, I thought I might as well sit back and enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I said, well, I'm just sorry now. I've borrowed, borrowed money. I, I've borrowed so much money since you'd have done really well out of me. Because that's what we've done all the time. We've borrowed money, worked like hell, paid it back, and reinvested, 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 reinvested. Anyway, students are performing from all over the world. And we have one... Uh, uh, we, I started with nine and then 11 students, and now we have 60 students, and I'm not getting any bigger, uh, because we can keep in touch with all the, well, that's not on my watch anyway, because uh, we can keep in touch with all the students and know their names and everything. We have one teacher with every six students, and the first thing I do, as I said, is uh, introduce them to the soil, and our gardeners, farm manager, the first thing they do then is we walk down through the farm and gardens, and we, uh, the first thing, the first recipe they get is how to make compost. And then the first thing we show them how to do is to sow a seed. And uh, we do three three-month certificate courses in the year for students who want to earn their living from the cooking. These are people who are going to be chefs and cooks. And, uh, in, uh, and they are all over the world at this stage because we're going, it's been, the school has been going for so long. And if I had my way, I mean, I'm, I'm such a bossy headmistress, so I get worse, actually. As the, but I wouldn't let any chef or cook uh, into a restaurant kitchen until they spent at least a year on farm gardens. And then it would knock some of the arrogance out of them. You know, that I want it and I want it now. And a lot of, it's getting much better and there are of course exceptions to this, but many uh, chefs and cooks have no idea about the seasons or they're certainly not the reality of nature or that a crop can fail or whatever. Uh, so they introduce them to the thing. And then we also have, 
and they go out with the gardeners in the morning to bring in the produce on a rotated basis and all that. They can learn how to milk the cows in our little micro dairy. We have a micro dairy where we make butter, cheese, yogurt, and of course raw milk as well. A bre the bread shed, I don't know, the, uh, there, uh, there's some, oh yeah. This is, these are some of my grandchildren, uh, which you don't need to know about, but this is their, their the, the green hat. There she is hiding, looking very guilty with the peas in her pocket. Uh, <laughs> anyway, we have a bread shed. Uh, we're like trailer trash now with some of those trailers that transport the food all over the country. Uh, we've converted them into a bread shed where we do sourdough bread and it's like a little a bakery uh, and people come for 50, 60 miles for the bread we only sell from our farm shop and from the farmer's market and but of course it, mostly it's teaching uh, we teach fermenting foraging and there's a deep craving to re reconnect um, with uh, how food is produced and that's why people come from over now 160 countries around the world to this little cooking school out in the country in Cork because they can learn literally from the from the seed upwards and the scraps from their morning's cooking get fed to the hens and come back as eggs the next day and uh, then the, uh, we also teach butchery and we have some uh, we have some cattle and pigs and I'm a dairy farmer I have nine cows nine Jersey cows and we the royal we uh, 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 mark, uh, uh, they milk them every morning uh, so the, we do apart from the long course we do day courses two and a half day courses week courses and this summer we're doing a five week course as well for people who can't get away for 12 weeks. But one of the things I'm most excited about uh, is that we uh, are, last year for the first time, and I've wanted to do this since before 2008 when the whole economy collapsed in Ireland, is we do a six week sustainable food production course uh, using all the resources of the farm and gardens and greenhouses. And uh, this is a thing that has just grown gradually as we see another opportunity or to get asked for something else, we put it on and teach it. So we have, uh, Patrick was talking about the impact on the local area and so on. Actually, one of the students at UCC has done a PhD on the impact on the local community of this little business and, of course, by new as well. So we employ, um, this really shocks farmers. Uh, we have a 100-acre organic farm and we have 60, uh, we have 60 staff, okay? Uh, that's for the cooking school uh, as well as the, the farm and gardens. And they're full-time and some full-time part-time, if you know what I mean. Uh, we buy our food, what we don't produce ourselves, we uh, try to source as far as possible in the local area. Of course we buy spices and all sorts of things from all over the world, trying to get the best of everything and often linking directly with the producer in the, somewhere in the world. Uh, so we have over 120 small artisan producers, farmers, people who rear chickens, ducks, geese, uh, smoke fish for us, farmhouse cheese, etc. And we also link in with, uh, under one of my other hats called my Slow Food Hat, uh, we have a uh, project with nine local schools where we teach the children how to grow and how to cook. Oh my God, you can't imagine the excitement. They absolutely love it. Every one of those schools must have an edible school garden. Uh, we send a chicken coop and two hens to all the schools so the kids learn how to keep chickens and they uh, feed chickens. They, uh, they, they take feed out the coop and put it onto the compost heap in the uh, school garden and then uh, they know how to keep the chicken. So if the kids can, if we can teach the kids how to grow and how to cook, it doesn't matter what the bankers do, they'll be absolutely fine. They'll have their, their life skills. <laughs> I'm no, sorry. no, it's, it's fine, but I think maybe yeah. we, should, we should open it up now. But yes, absolutely. Last, Just the, what, the last, yes. one of the two last things. So the, uh, so the gardens and the farm are open to the public as an educational uh, thing as well. And the local economy, they, they, you'd be amazed what 60 students can do to the local villages We're out in the country. They uh, buy in the local shops and pubs, and we have romances and weddings. <laughs> and, uh, and so uh, and there's a farm shop in a Winnebago cafe in a Winnebago in the summer when you come to visit us. So thank you. <laughs> I've been to Ballyballoo quite a few times now, and what I think is remarkable is that the whole uh, economy of the cookery school and the hotel have reversed uh, the rural exodus to the city and are now attracting young people back. So the places 
It's magnetic. It's culturally magnetic, and it's employing people, but it's also it's social and cultural. It's not just about employment, it's much more than that. And it seems to me that all our speakers have shared their visions about how we can reverse what's been going on during the whole of my farming lifetime. And what I really aspire to do in West Wales on my own farm is to, is to not exactly have a mini Mali Malou, but I think in a way we all do. We all want to be hubs of the revitalization of our food economies and our local rural culture. And I thought it's very nice to end with Darina because she's made it so social and cultural, and so often that's left out. But, so, to you now, uh, what would you like to ask? I'll go to Tim uh, first, Agroecology, to see if there's anybody still with us. Thank you. Um, since I've got the mic, uh, a guy called Dave Plants has Instagrammed us and asked, um, this is really uh, towards Darina um, and, uh, and, and on behalf of the Clear Estates as well, how can we open up these tenancy agreements and land to get those little entrepreneurs just that first step on the ladder um, so that we can have lots of these wonderfully sort of um, enterprising uh, growers and, uh, and, and farm shops and so on. Yeah, you go first, Adrian. Well, we, we have a, we try to be proactive in a, a new entrant program um, and that will see Opportunities created, as I, I, I mentioned, that we will we will ensure that the, the starting point is to ensure that the farm is credible. Um, and a, a recent example is where we've had a farm um, up in Estelle, in Liddesdale, in some really tough farming country. We made it very clear that it's it's not a viable proposition. It's a part-time opportunity on which they will use that as a platform to develop their business, and in turn, it will lead on to perhaps a, a, a larger tenancy. So we have small scale from, of a few hundred acres of starter farms, but, but on, on the sort of example I've just given, but we also have um, other illustrations where they go up to 2,000 acres um, for a new entrant to start. Now, you, you, you perhaps got a flavor of the type of landscape we operate in. So once that sounds like a big area, as a hill farming unit, it's, it's not exceptional. So it's, it's really establishing that it's credible um, and then creating the environment where we can nurture that individual in a way that they, they, they succeed. So Darina, do you want to add to that well, in any way? Actually, we don't have, in fact, a tenant farm system in Ireland, but basically one of the, several times, they made, several of the speakers touched on uh, the, the regulations that are totally out of proportion to the risk involved. So it's something we must all work together uh, to try to make some kind of sane thing so that we can encourage anybody with any little jot of entrepreneurial spirit to get on with doing something. And again, with a different hat, I share something called the Artisan Food Forum in Ireland, which meets with the Food Safety Authority of Ireland three or four times a year, more often if necessary, to articulate the challenges and the difficulties that the artisan, especially food, specialty food sector, um, uh, encounter. And we have quite good communication. Sometimes I feel like the little boy, the little Dutch boy with his arm in the, in the dam. You know, you plug one hole and up comes another. Uh, but basically, uh, this is the fundamental to actually uh, getting businesses going in the country and, and uh, for rural regeneration and everything is for people, anybody who wants to do something to be supported. We've got a bit better at it in Ireland, but gosh, there's still a long way to go. And probably as a result, the most, in, interest, the most exciting thing on the food scene in Ireland in the last 30, 25, 30 years has been the emergence of an artisan and specialty food sector where people, are, even on tiny farms, are adding value to their produce and selling at a network of local farmers markets and so on. You have tremendous things going on over here too, but that's, the key is, instead of saying, no, you can't, no, you can't, no, you can't, yes, you flip and well can and we'll find a way <laughs> Okay, there we are. <laughs> um, Caroline, yes, please. Yeah. Um, we have a, a management company called Rural Culture CIC, which is set up to, to look at this whole, how do we get more great food coming out of the system? And we're exploring some ideas at the moment with um, the National Trust and looking at tenancy ideas. And one of them is to go in as a company, as a management company, with lots of people with lots of skills um, that can help a new tenant sort of develop a new, a, a new way of doing things. Um, but one of the ideas is, is Primal Meats to come in as a, an actual um, sort of share partner and, and buy the livestock so that we can secure a future supply and have an arrangement of sort of then buying that back over time. But it's just a, 
There's different models that you can play around with, and that's just one of the ones we're looking for. Ben, do you want to add on? I, I, I knew that we've just, in the last year, seen a couple of examples of um, entrepreneurial producers actually starting out um, specifically to sell through farm drop. Um, because that's we're, we're presenting ourselves yeah. as, a, as, as solve, trying to solve that problem. Like here's a here's so a viable market, distribution channel. Yeah. You get the, these are the economics. Like, all right, I'm going to give that a crack now because I know there's going to be somewhere to actually have a positive commercial experience. Well, that's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. Who's next? Was there somebody over here or was it over there? No, it's over there. Yes, please. Uh, four fantastic and inspiring stories. Thank you very much. What did you receive, or what do you think you would have benefited from receiving as in your early journey that would get you to where you are now, or got you to where you are now, quicker and faster? What, what could we give to your younger self that would either you received or didn't receive? Okay, Caroline, you start. <laughs> the holistic perspective that I've got now that I could have done with right back in the beginning, perhaps. I think it's a mindset thing, and of course, funding is always welcome. So. Just getting a leg up to get some of this stuff off the ground would be great. And, and still, we're still very early on in this process, and still it would be really helpful to get some support to develop new ideas. Just because these new ideas can't be profitable off the, you know, you've got to, it takes a while to develop them. So for the farming systems, you know, we want to be able to go in and take a tenancy on, but we want to be able to explore how we can farm better and tie up, with, you know, all of the supply chain. But we need a bit of financial support to get that going. So. That's hugely welcome, that's available. Anybody else want to add to that? Uh, Adrian? Just to add that um, one of the examples we used was where we had a tenant that we weren't confident of the proposition they were putting forwards, but we still wanted to try and work with them to enable them to continue to farm. And that required to be quite creative and innovative in coming up with a, uh, an agreement where we put some of the equity into the, into the business. And Within that, we have a, a sort of strict time scale as to how that business, where that business will generate the funds to repay that equity. Um, there is a degree of, of flexibility in that, but but we wanted to make it very clear um, how that model would work. So, working capital is a huge issue to get started in farming, and so where we can try and do something a little bit different, um, then, then then we will look at that. Darina. Well, we, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a great believer in starting small. It's not for everybody. We had very little money, so we started, we borrowed as much as we could get and then worked like mad and, and then paid it back and uh, got a big note. So we were able to learn as we went along. And in some ways, I think it might have been, I know some people get grants, and I'm almost down to grant. That sounds like a funny thing to say, but for the reason that sometimes if you get a nice big whack of money, it's easier to spend it. And so, but if you're, you know, if you're very tight, uh, you have to really watch what you're doing. And I think that is, it's actually op the opposite to what you asked me, uh, but it's, it's, I think it's an, sometimes it can be an advantage not to have a whole pile of money behind you because you have to think about every single thing. Ben. I, I can certainly no longer count the number of mistakes that I've made. Um, <laughs> But, but, but are they good or bad? Well, I, 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 don't, I think maybe I had to make them up to yeah. find how to make it work. And, 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 but but I, I do remember quite a, a few conversations with mates in the pub and I was telling them about this amazing idea and it was click and collect and it was the first version of Farm Drop. And it was, it was a, unfortunately, it was just quite a terrible idea. And, and, <laughs> and, and they'd sort of look at me and go, oh, well, good luck with that, you know. And actually what they were signaling was like, this is a terrible idea. Um, <laughs> and, and I should have just probably paid more attention to that. <laughs> uh, I think there's another questioner over here. Yes. Hi, my name is Marianne Hill. Um, three years ago, I was a simple tenant FBT farmer, didn't even live on my own, uh, my own farm. Then something rather miraculous happened. Someone suggested I apply to the Savory Institute. And I went, me? And they went, yes, you. And on the back of that, 3LM was formed. And I'm still farming. But I, I knew then that I was doing something else. And I wanted to work with consumers and farmers. And um, a little while ago, I was dealing with another lady in a totally different industry. And we said, we need to get to the con consumers that really want to know about health and the environment. And they're growing, but how do we do it? 
Anyway, we're putting together a festival in 2019. It's conjoined health show and food festival. We're aiming at 20,000 people. And a few months ago, and a very quiet afternoon, I wanted to come up with sort of a, a snag line for the, the festival, but I came up with this instead, and I hope you don't mind me reading it to you. We don't want to roll the dice of our economy. We want a solid economy regenerated from the soil up to grow our local economies into a strong national economy with a renewed sense of community. We don't want to roll the dice of our health. We want to thrive, and we understand that good food naturally produced on local regenerating soil will do a lot more than improve our health. We don't want to roll the dice of climate change. We want a vibrant ecosystem for all future generations. And we understand that through our individual buying power, we can steer the future for our health, for a stable economy and rejuvenated communities, whilst re reducing the impact of climate, both at home and around the world. And I've had a number of people say, that is what we need, and that is what we're working upon. But more than anything else, I want you guys, the farmers, to become joined up, work as a co-op. And the other side of that, I'm working to fund resources so that we can come together with shared resources like we've been talking about. Yeah. Dip your toe in the water, get on the map, and find lots of local customers. And then uh, when you've got your customer, ask him what else he wants and help build a local supply chain. And uh, we want everyone who's here to be on the map, and we want to, uh, this best practice to go all over the country. So our map becomes a, an Uber of local food, as Joel wants, uh, and we can build, build that together. There's 120 billion spent in supermarkets. If we can get that out into local communities, it can be an incredible uh, way of building them. Thank you. Well, where you from? Before, oh, well, have we got somebody? Yes. Yes, please. Where, where's the microphone now? Um, I just, it was a question mainly for Darina, um, just about, obviously you're sending out all these, it's not meant negatively, but disciples really of the positive food movement. Um, and when they're going back to different countries and how, obviously not everyone can have a farm, so how are they finding, kind of integrating into the local food systems there, and you know, what are the farm drops and primal meats of other countries? Do you have, do you have much experience and understanding of that? Uh, well, at this stage, as you can imagine, we've got a network all around the world, and after the poor things have been with me for three months, they're thoroughly brainwashed. <laughs> so they, when they go home, they, uh, it doesn't matter if you live in, you see, it doesn't matter whether you live in a city, in, a, in an apartment, or uh, whatever, you can, uh, uh, they, they certainly want to be able to grow something, because one of the, the things is that they realize that, you know, that all good cooking comes from really good produce. So they're desperate to link them with local farmers and food producers uh, to get the produce. But apart from that, then, the very least, they start to grow on their windowsills and on their balconies or whatever, even in, in uh, salad leaves or something like that. So that happens. I get, uh, I get photographs from time to time when people say, we got some hens, we got the hens at last. Uh, so they do, uh, students do tell me, and there were several past students here, uh, in the, they may still be in the group today, uh, at this time, who say that they live their lives in a different way. And then I also say to them, as they leave, I say, look, remember how fortunate all of us are that we've been in a position to be able to learn how to cook and the way it can change people's lives and the way to everybody's heart and all that sort of thing. And I say, I want each and every one of you to go out and pass on your skill, even if it's only showing people how to make a loaf of bread or a bowl of soup or something. Quietly, in some way, you can really make a difference. And so that's the, and then they go out all, all over the, the place. So I think uh, there, there are little things growing and things in, all over the world uh, and people living, d doing things in a slightly different way, maybe. Hopefully, I think, they, they, after they've been with us. Mm. Well, my daughter, Alice, is one of the Ballymaloo <laughs> alumni, and she's growing <laughs> vegetables, uh, salad vegetables in London. So I can confirm that. Um, Tracy. Hi, Tracy, was the Farms Not Factories. This is to Adrian. I just wondered if you had any growers, vegetable growers and what sort of contract you have with them. And actually, the real excuse for that question was, I am looking for a grower. I have three polytunnels and a walled garden. If anybody knows anybody, or a couple, please let me know, because all of you are so close to the land, you might just know somebody who wants to be a partner. 
um, badminton, which is uh, South Gloucestershire, um, near Bristol Bar, <laughs> to sell vegetables to you. Uh, Adrian, we, <coughs> unfortunately we don't have any growers at the moment. We have one or two walled gardens that, that could actually facilitate some sort of new opportunity. Um, and so, but what I would say is that we would consider all propositions. If somebody came to us and said, I want to grow vegetables, or, do you have any land? We will look at it. Okay, well everyone else, if you uh, have a, are a grower, or have a grower in mind, you can talk to Tracy, uh, please. Oh, go somewhere else. I'm sorry, just a couple of quick questions okay, for, yes. for Ben. Um, most of the people in the room here, or many of the people in the room, niche producers for whom provenance is really important. Um, are you able to make a connection with your customers so that your customers understand the provenance? And secondly, um, do you, are you able to educate them about seasonality and about the whole beast as well so that they're not just choosing the prime cuts? Thanks very much. Um, the first question suggests that I did a pretty bad job of my presentation because the, because the whole concept's about provenance and, 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 and it's really about every item of food that we sell is from an actual producer whose story we tell. So one of the enduring true heroes of the farm block story is, is Rowie from Purton House who's here today. Like if somebody's buying some of her kale, some of her amazing organic sausages, you're buying them from Rowie and you can go through and learn about her and House Organics and what's going on on her farm. We want to take that much further, that, that the shape, the hand that feeds you idea, we think we can, we can make that happen digitally and so there's much more cool stuff that we can do. So it's all about making the farmers the heroes and, and, and actually building that understanding. Um, and then the seasonality point is a really good one. The first version of Farm Drop had 100% within 50 mile food, zero import, zero anything, and, and there were also zero customers. Um, and, 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 and actually, it's, it's, that ship has sailed, you've got to, we import um, organic bananas and citrus and avocados because we have to have that as part of our offer to retain customers on a weekly basis. Um, but what we do via our content is just make a massive deal out of local asparagus when it comes on and we're just driving the message around seasonality and using recipes as well of it to try and pull people with us gently but if you ram it too hard then you just push them back to Tesco's. Okay this is going to be the last question and then anybody else is absolutely determined to ask one because we're running out of time. Thank you. Uh, ben Hunt, uh, Grub Trade. It's really, it's, it's a question for the whole panel, and just to kind of summarise the, the feel that, that I've got from the conference so far, I was struck by when Joel mentioned the, the swap between what we spend on food is now replaced by what we spend on health, or certainly in, in, in the United States, and I imagine it's, it's similar here as well, certainly we're spending a lot less on food. Um, and I, I also wonder whether with the, the comparison, um, I think Caroline made between the, uh, the, the gut and the soil, and that we've been doing something so, so similar with nature and with our soil as well, in, in that you know, we've been trying to, we're mining the soil, we've been producing cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, and the costs have to be picked up somewhere along the line, so you, know, you have to go back and amend it. Um, so the feeling I'm getting from all of this is, it's a kind of a, a sense of, you know, we all so much want and desire to be more resilient and to, you know, I can't remember who, who, who said, but let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. You know, we want to be preventative. We want a healthy, permanently healthy uh, system in, in our food, in our bodies, in our economy and all of that. And I just wonder, you know, what the, the, the panel feel, how the panel feel about staring down the barrel of Brexit and this kind of delicious terror of, <laughs> of, of you know, massive change that we're all facing. Well, what a, what a wonderful reflection to end on. Uh, so, uh, would you like to start, Caroline? Regardless of how you feel about Brexit, I think it's, it's creative disruption, isn't it? And for me, that's the type of business I'm, I'm looking at, is, is trying to find that blue ocean where what's not being done 
what are the you know where are the opportunities and it's and it's generating you know a shift in that and, and that's good news so yeah you're absolutely right the the, the whole link between the soil microbiome and, and, the, and the human gut microbiome is just incredible. And, and I think that also brings a more, you know, um, a more holistic perspective to everything. And I think that's really helpful, but it's exciting. And I, and I also feel that we're really on that tipping point now. So I'm really excited about the future. I think we're, and, and a huge amount of that's been down to a lot of these events that you've organized and, you know, all of the people in the room that are pushing this. And I think, we should, you know, it's, yeah, exciting times ahead. Adrian. I haven't commented on soil, although we do have quite a lot of it, but <laughs> <laughs> what I would say is, uh, without sounding flippant, is, is that enhanced communications, enhanced research, um, creating opportunity for people, um, and, and, and really focusing on that rural economy and, and how, how we can generate investment and um, opportunity. <clears throat> Darina. Well, just to cheer you up, we think that Ireland will be much more uh, you know, badly affected by Brexit than you are over here. Even uh, we'll, uh, you know, because of the the, the the price of sterling and all of that. So we export a lot of our thing. And also, I'm not quite sure how the border issue is going to be uh, uh, is going to be resolved. You can't put a square peg into a round hole. Doesn't matter how much everybody wants to. And that's a big worry. But just on the for one second on the gut biome, because uh, uh, today somebody mentioned, of course, that the health of the soil and the health of all of our gut and everything else is absolutely totally connected and much more research has been done on that now and just on this term we're linking up the university college in cork where a lot of work has been research is being done by uh, professor ted dynan there on the link between our not only our physical health uh, but and our mental health but between the gut biome and our physical and mental health so before this group of students arrived in last week we sent them out a letter and asked how many of you would be interested in giving a sample of poo when they came uh, to actually for UCC uh, because they're coming literally from 12 uh, countries around the world uh, to uh, participate in uh, some research to see they take they've taken a sample the other day 26 students by the way out of 60 did they take it they uh, took a sample before they took a bite of food which most of the food they would be eating they're not all at the school would be organic or local and so on and then they will take another sample at the end of the 12 weeks and they're going to compare them to see how, how the difference wonderful. in the gut <laughs> is Based feeding trial. Exactly. Yes, I thought we might have cancellations. Everyone <laughs> <laughs> sent out this uh, that letter. But anyway, sorry. Ben, have, have, have to follow that. I guess <laughs> <laughs> the, 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 um, politicians generally speak a load of crap. And, um, and, 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 in, and, in, and in what my focus is, is just kind of getting on with trying to support and, and protect local farmers by giving them great terms and in exchange they look after the soil and and produce amazing food which means that my children don't have to take antibiotics i think that's been a brilliant theme for the last two days that symbiotic system that's just absolutely being being regenerated now and the the, it, the politicians will do what the politicians will do i, I, I haven't got time or patience to, to to wait to see what happens um, I really hope it's a good outcome, um, but yeah, we just got to crack on, I think. Well, I'm going to say some thank yous in a moment, but uh, I think it's rather appropriate that we've ended up on this theme of the, the microbiome, because in a way I feel that um, the conferences like this and I've participated in quite a few, they generate an atmosphere of shared consciousness, which I think is another level of microbiome. And it's when, when if, things, if the conditions are right, and they've been so amazingly right here at Fur Farm, um, over a couple of days, we sort of co-generate an atmosphere where we become more porous, where uh, maybe it's partly because we're eating the same good food, but also we're sharing ideas and we're sharing each other's company, and we're sharing a, an enhanced state which arises literally, we co-create from our own togetherness, which then uh, creates conditions which for being inspired and receiving the food of the 
the ideas that are shared by the speakers, which leaves us in a slightly different state to when we came. And I think that's uh, what we have done over the last couple of days. And so I think it's appropriate for me to start by thanking the panel, Caroline, Adrian, Darina, Ben, for your wonderful uh, shared contributions to end this feast. And so thank you very much. like to thank all of you um, for coming and sharing in this. Uh, it's so much has felt to me as if we've created this together. And your amazing attention yesterday and today, despite the tiredness, we, there's, it's felt as if we've never lost the thread of good attention which has prevailed throughout this event. And some of you have come from a long way, all over the world actually. I just met a couple who have come from the Middle East, especially, and that's touching people come so far and travel so widely to be with us. Um, I want to thank especially though, of course, our speakers. Uh, the two Joels, um, Michael Gove and Minette Batters, but all the panelists over the two days and the rich, rich uh, experience and ideas that uh, they've shared with us. Uh, I can't thank you enough for giving up your time and putting so much effort into preparing your contributions. They've been amazing, and uh, I think we're all rich by them. So thank you all very much. I also want to thank um, the, some of the organizing uh, teams, because there have been several of them. Uh, I want to thank uh, Paddy Hall, birthday boy of yesterday and his team. Fantastic. Amazing. <laughs> and Caroline and her team for the delicious, life-enhancing food. <laughs> Served with such love, care and attention. Amazing. Uh, really just took it to another level. Thank you so much. Um, I want to thank Agricology uh, and the Twitter feed and all that you bought and hopefully there are a few people still participating in this. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I also uh, want to tell you that all the sessions have been filmed and they're going to be downloaded on our website. I'm not sure exactly how soon, but fairly soon, as soon as we get it together. Uh, and uh, that uh, Guy's songs uh, with uh, his co-pilgrim who wasn't with us uh, are also going to be available, I think, on the website, so they'll, they'll, you'll find them. Uh, so if you want to hear him and his uh, co-founder singing uh, what, we, what we listen to, they'll be there as well. Um, I also want to thank the SFT team who've been fantastic throughout the event and in the preparation. <laughs> Bonnie, uh, Megan, Alicia, Richard, uh, and other people who are not here in the SFT. Hannah, Hannah, look at even the filming as I speak. <laughs> Thank you all very much indeed. And lastly, uh, Jane said she would be very cross if I uh, thanked her and Alan again, but I just can't not thank them because they are two very, very fine human beings. And without their generosity, uh, both towards the SFT, but also in terms of sponsoring this event uh, and providing this incredible venue, uh, the event wouldn't have taken place. And I honestly think that it's, it has been and will continue to be a significant influence. This gathering will be a significant influence, which will the ripples from which will go out for some considerable time in making sure that the post-Brexit evolution of a more conducive environment for the uh, food systems that we need for the future uh, will uh, evolve. So uh, thank goodness for that. Thank God for that. And bless you all. And there is now, I think, a drink. And so safe journeys home. Thank you. Thank you.